This is a review of renal GFR reabsorption, secretion, and clearance. So to begin, I want to talk about the GFR, otherwise known as the glomerular filtration rate. And so to first start to understand the GFR, we have to talk about um, the fact that the GF or the filtration, excuse me, takes place specifically at the beginning of the nephron. So here, I'm going to circle this region right around here where you see the arrow. Okay. This is where GFR is taking place. All right, GFR. And in fact, you see it right here in this little cartoon example saying 100 mils per minute. That would be our GFR. That would be the volume moving through or being filtered into the nephron every minute. And this number over here, 600 mils per minute, actually represents the plasma blood flow going to the nephron. I understand that this plasma blood flow of 600 mils per minute uh, doesn't represent blood flow to a single nephron, but blood flow to all the nephrons in both kidneys. So that's meant to represent the volume collectively. And you'll notice something here is the 600 mils all right, makes its way towards this region here, which this right here is really the glomerulus, which is a specialized capillary. And so there's going to be filtration that takes place along the entire glomerulus. And then you'll see this big arrow here, which indicates the volume of the 600 mils over here that got filtered into the nephron. And that's 100 mils. So 100 mils out of this 600 mils got filtered into the nephron. And this right here, so we're clear, is the nephron. Okay. And the rest of the volume that did not filter into the nephron will now then make its way into this region over here which is actually the peritubular capillaries. The peritubular capillaries are the capillaries that surround the nephron so that they can continue to exchange uh, with the nephron. And by exchange, I mean mostly reabsorb, taking things from the nephron lumen and redistributing it back into the bloodstream. But in some cases, you will have secretion where things that are in the capillaries will then be moved into, and I'll draw a little arrow here, will be moved into the nephron lumen. So you're going to get both. So this will be reabsorption, taking it out and into the bloodstream, and then, of course, moving uh, from the bloodstream into the nephron. The majority of the actions that will take place are primarily reabsorption. So again, just to be clear, these numbers, and by the way, these numbers do represent physiologically normal numbers, where we have 600 mils per minute of blood plasma flowing to the nephron, 100 mils of that will end up inside the nephron, and the other 500 mils will end up in the peritubular capillary system. And again, as they make their way out of this corpuscular region here where filtration just took place, and make their way into the proximal convoluted tubule region, you will start to have exchanges with that peritubular capillary. Ultimately, what you're going to end with after all the reabsorption secretion is done, you'll end up with about one mil per minute of urine production, which will be ultimately excreted into the urine. So whatever makes it to this point will end up as urine. And as you can see, if we started with 100 mils that entered, 100 mils per minute entering into the nephron, and we're left with about one mil per minute at the end, we've reabsorbed approximately about 99% of what was filtered. Keep in mind that in order for it to be filtered, usually means it has to be dissolved freely in the plasma and not bound to proteins or inside the cells in the blood. So red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets do not get filtered. Proteins, for the most part, will not get filtered either, and anything bound to the proteins. Okay, so let's take a look at this graph quickly. Now, what this graph is trying to demonstrate here using different GFRs, so we have a GFR of uh, 125, a GFR of 100, and a GFR of 50 mils per minute. And so obviously the greater the GFR, the larger volume per minute is making its way through the nephron. And we can actually make a calculation uh, if we know what the plasma concentration is of a substance. So let's take an example. Uh, let's start with this very first number, how about, over here, so we got 100. So let's take 
our plasma concentration. Now pay attention because this plasma concentration is in milligrams per 100 ml or uh, per deciliter. So it could be written either way, but that's the same thing. So 100 milligrams per 100 ml. So that's the concentration of whatever this substance happens to be. Now understand, we're assuming that this substance can be freely filtered. Now if I multiply that, okay, by the GFR, so I'm going to multiply that by the GFR. In this case, the GFR happens to be, um, or excuse me, in this example, I'll use 100 mLs per minute. And that's actually going to give me my filtered quantity. That's my filtered quantity in milligrams per minute. So let's try this. I'm going to write it a little bit differently so it's hopefully clear. 100 milligrams per 100 ml times 100 ml per minute, which is again our GFR. All right, that's the volume that's getting filtered. And this is the concentration of this particular substance that would be dissolved in this volume. Okay, so we can see here this cancel out. Okay, and what you're left with is 100 milligrams per minute. So what that translates into is we have, given the GFR of 100 mils per minute, there are 100 milligrams that are getting filtered every minute. So if we look at the graph over here and we take our plasma concentration that we just calculate it's right here about 100 milligrams per 100 ml all right and we're going to uh, our gfr was 100 mls per minute that means our filtered quantity is 100 milligrams per minute so here this is our filtered quantity here on the y-axis and you can see that's right here okay right there so that lines up okay now we could do this again if we do it at 200 milligrams per 100 ml and i'll write this out quickly so we can see so here's 200 milligrams per 100 ml times 100 mls per minute and again i'm using the same gfr of 100 mls per minute these would cancel and we'd end up with 200 milligrams per minute so that would be the filtered quantity the amount of substance that's being filtered every minute at that given GFR of 100 mLs. So again, we go here to 200 uh, milligrams per 100 mL. And at 200, our filter quantity is 200 milligrams per minute. So that puts us right here. And you'll see that this is going to continue to be linear. Every single time we increase the concentration of the substance, so long as it is freely filterable and moves uh, through the glomerulus and into the nephron, uh, we'll continue to filter higher and higher quantities of that substance for a particular GFR. So this would be, this slope would show you the rate with which we we're going to filter the quantity of that substance. Now, if the GFR was lower, we could recalculate the same concentrations for a GFR of 50, and you see the slope is lower, meaning we're not gonna filter as much of that substance every minute, simply because we're not moving as much volume every minute. And then the reverse can be said if we were to calculate the same concentrations of a GFR of 125, where we're now moving larger volumes every minute, we would move a lot more substance. And you can see that the slope here is actually greater than at 100 mils per minute. Okay, so now to talk about reabsorption. The first thing we have to understand is that we don't forget about filtration. So that's why I have here the same cartoon, which is showing the nephron with the blood up here in the right hand corner. So you can see again, filtration is taking place right here where the glomerulus, okay, uh, meets the nephron and you'll get filtration. So here's our same volume, 600. All right. So here's 600 mils per minute. Here's hundred mils per minute, which again would, in this case would be our GFR. And then there here's 500 mils per minute. That is the volume that did not get filtered into the nephron. Now, you'll notice that we have a linear curve over here, 
which is expressing filtered, which looks just like what we saw before. And in fact, the information I have to give you right now is I have to tell you that the GFR for this example is going to equal 100 mils per minute. So that's, that's the given. And if you want to double check that by doing the same calculations we did on the previous slide, you can. So you'll see that it ends up being at 100 milligrams per 100 ml at a GFR of 100 would give us a filtered quantity of about 100, which is right about here and 200 right about here and so on. And you would see that this is linear as we continue to increase the con plasma concentration at the same GFR would get more and more filtered quantity and it would be linear in relationship just like we saw on the previous page. Now, what's different in this example is we're talking about reabsorption only. So this is going to have to be a reminder at this point that for many substances that are reabsorbed, they are not secreted. And for many substances that are secreted, they are not reabsorbed. Now that's not true for all substances, but for many. And so we're going to go with that assumption right now that if it is reabsorbed, it is not secreted. And if it is secreted, it is not reabsorbed. So let's take a look at a substance that is reabsorbed and is not secreted. An example of something like that would be like glucose. So let me write that here, glucose. So glucose is an example of a substance that is reabsorbed and is not secreted. All right. Now, the next piece of information that I would have to give you is something called a transport maximum or T, big T, little m. And that just represents the maximum that this receptor is able to transport this given substance or glucose in this case uh, from inside the nephron into the blood. So if we look over here at our little cartoon in the top right hand corner, so this arrow is indicating reabsorption. So we're moving it out of the nephron into the peritubular capillaries. And the ability for it to move that substance um, from the nephron and into the peritubular capillaries all right, is based on uh, the characteristics of that receptor. So they're usually specific, like a glucose receptor. And the amount it's able to move over time is called the transport maximum. So in this case, I'm going to give you an example of glucose where the transport maximum is 375 and that's milligrams per minute. So that's the amount of substance um, that can be moved every minute by these receptors that are located lining the nephron lumen. And so they're able to pull glucose out of the nephron lumen and transport it into ultimately the blood, uh, blood plasma. And so we refer to this uh, as reabsorption. So from inside the nephron lumen and into the blood plasma is referred to as reabsorption. So this is information that we need to have. So we have a GFR of 100 and a TM of 375 milligrams per minute. So let's just see what happens now. As I filter higher and higher quantities, right? So we, can, we know how to calculate a filtered quantity. So you guys are able to do that, right? Again, if we take 300 milligrams per 100 ml, okay? That would be a filtered quantity of about 300. So I'm gonna put a little mark right here and you can see it's pretty much linear and we'll continue to have linear quantities that are filtered at every single point along here, okay? But that's the property of being filtered. Once it's in the nephron though, when it makes it past the corpuscle and into this proximal convoluted tubule area, which I'm just gonna write down as PCT, proximal convoluted tubule area, some of the substances are going to start to be reabsorbed and moved into the peritubular capillary. And the amount per minute that can be moved, in this case, is gonna be 375 milligrams per minute. So let's quickly do an example. If I have 300 milligrams per 100 ml, okay, that's my concentration of this substance, which we'll say is glucose. Let's multiply that by the GFR this is exactly what we did in the previous page. So that's 100 uh, mLs per minute. All right, so the filtered quantity, you cross these out because they cancel, right? 300 milligrams per minute. So 300 milligrams per minute has made its way into the nephron and it will get into this proximal convoluted tubule area. Now, what is our TM of the receptors that line the proximal convoluted tubule? 
Well, in this case, it's 375 milligrams per minute. So what does that mean? That means that the cells with these receptors that line the proximal convoluted tubule will be able to move glucose out of the nephron and into the blood at a rate of about 375 milligrams per minute. We just calculated right now for about that we have a, a filtration of about 300 milligrams per minute. Well, that's that's less than 375 milligrams per minute. And so therefore we are underneath the transport maximum for those receptors. And so all of that glucose will be able to be reabsorbed. Now let's do one more example. If I take 400 milligrams per 100 ml, multiply that by the GFR, which is 100 ml per minute, that's going to come out to 400 milligrams per minute. Now this is actually greater than the transport maximum of 375 milligrams per minute. So therefore, the transporter can only move 375 milligrams out of the nephron and into the blood plasma, which is going to leave behind, all right, that's again, uh, 400 minus 375, which is equal to 25. That's going to leave behind in the nephron, I'm going to draw it up here, 25 milligrams per minute. Now that is the quantity that did not get reabsorbed. That got left behind in the nephron that will ultimately make its way into the urine. Because these transporters are only able to move 375 milligrams per minute out of the nephron and into the blood plasma. Which again, now if it's at 400, that would leave behind 25. So that would be what's ultimately going to be excreted into the urine is 25 milligrams. And so let's take a look at what that looks like on the graph. If we take a look at here, this is 400 here on the x-axis. Okay. Now what's being filtered is, yes, it's 400 milligrams per minute. That's what got into the nephron. So that's what this point is here on the filtered line. But you'll notice here, under reabsorptions, this is what's reabsorbed. You'll notice that it plateaus here, and this is going to be equivalent to about 375 milligrams per minute, which means that at every higher concentration, although it's being filtered, we're still only reabsorbing 375. So we're always going to subtract. So let's go back to 400. So 400 was filtered, 375 was reabsorbed, which left behind 25. That 25 that got left behind is all going to be excreted. So down here is the excretion curve. So you'll notice the excretion curve only started once we got higher than 375 milligrams per minute because that was our maximum. That means whatever gets left behind gets excreted. And the higher the concentration of substance that gets filtered, we can still only reabsorb 375. So the difference between what was filtered and what was reabsorbed is going to be what ends up being excreted. Okay, so now let's take a look at a substance that is secreted and not reabsorbed. So let's bring our attention back to this cartoon up in the up, uh, upper right hand side here. So I'm going to use the same numbers that we were using before, whereas if I have 600, this is mLs per minute of blood plasma moving its way towards the, uh, the glomerulus. And let's say again we have a GFR of 100. So that's our GFR. Let's say 100 mils per minute. So that's what got filtered into the nephron, which means in the paratubular capillaries, every minute 500 mLs per minute is now in the peritubular capillaries. So we're going to stick with the same numbers that we saw in the previous two slides. Okay. Now, in this case, we're talking about substance that is secreted. So the other information I'm going to give you, again, is a transport maximum, which is equal to 80 milligrams per minute. Now, what's important to understand here with secretion is we're talking about the reverse movement, as we did before. With reabsorption, we're taking something out of the nephron and moving it into the blood plasma. 
In this example, we're going to be moving something from the blood plasma into the nephron, which is why we see in the top right corner here in the cartoon, over here, you'll see the arrow is showing movement into the nephron. So it's being secreted into it. Ultimately, because what ends up in the nephron is going to be excreted into the urine. So that's the information I had to give you is this TM for this particular substance. All right. Now, this substance, again, can be freely filtered, meaning it will end up in the nephron from filtration at this point over here with the arrow for GFR. So that's going to be filtered in. And some of it's going to make its way into the paratubular capillaries here and get secreted in. So we're going to get um, this particular substance going to end up in the nephron via two ways, filtration as well as secretion. And it will not be reabsorbed. And so that means everything that got filtered in and secreted in, all of that will add up to what's being excreted into the urine. Okay, so let's take an example. So here's our filtration line again. And again, you can see that the filtered line is linear. And we can take a couple of examples just as a reminder of how to calculate that. So if we're looking at for the filtered quantity, this is the amount of the substance that got into the nephron through filtration. We can say we have 10 milligrams per 100 ml, remember your units, and the GFR is 100, so that's 100 mLs per minute. All right, that cancels out, which gives us 10 milligrams per minute. This makes the math nice and simple. And you can see this is going to be right around 10. All right, the 20 is going to be right around 20 or so. 40 is 40. 60 and 60 and so on so that's the substance that's getting filtered in and it will be linear just like we've seen in the previous two pages but now you'll notice that reabsorption which is over here is always zero because this substance doesn't get reabsorbed so let's see what happens when it gets secreted so if for example we have 10 milligrams per 100 ml and that's the concentration of the substance that means the filtered quantity that got into the nephron was 10 milligrams per minute. So now inside the nephron, all right, right here in filtration, we have 10 milligrams to begin. So that's 10 milligrams per minute that made it in that got by filtration. So this is what was filtered. Okay. Now that 10 milligrams is not going to be reabsorbed. So it's going to stay there and ultimately be excreted. But there's going to be more than 10 milligrams excreted because we're also going to be moving the same the substance that did not get filtered that's going to be secreted into the nephron. And so we have to be able to calculate how much substance is in the peritubular capillaries. All right, so that's the next step is how much substance is in this space in the peritubular capillaries. Remember this very first step we did here, which I'll mark as number one, this is the filtration step that told us how much substance got filtered inside the nephron with this volume all right for this 100 mils per uh per minute the gfr over here all right at this concentration this was the amount of substance that ended up in the nephron well now we're not talking about the gfr anymore we're talking about this volume 500 mils per minute not 100 mils per minute so i'm going to put that right here 500 mls per minute Excuse me, per minute. So again, it's not a GFR, it's the volume that ended up in the peritubular capillaries. And then the 10 milligrams per 100 ml, it's the same concentration, 10 milligrams per 100 ml. The concentration does not change, okay? Now, 10 milligrams per 100 ml got filtered into the nephron with a volume of 100 mLs per minute. That was the GFR. Now the 10 milligrams per 100 mL that didn't get filtered is in a volume of 500 mLs per minute. Okay, and that's the peritubular volume. So now I want to use that volume to find out how much of that substance is actually moving through the peritubular capillaries per minute. So let's do that calculation real quick. So I take the 100 mLs, and here's the mLs are gonna cancel out, okay? So that's uh, 500, 100 here. That's going to make this 5 instead of 500. 5 times 10 is 50. That's 50 milligrams 
per minute. So now we can compare these two. All right. This 10 milligrams per minute was the amount of substance that moved into the nephron during filtration. This 50 milligrams per minute is the amount of substance that ended up in the peritubular capillaries. So this is 50 milligrams per minute that's in the peritubular capillaries. Now the question is, how much of this 50 milligrams, and there's, again, I'll write it here so we're clear, there's 10 milligrams in here, how much of this substance can move into the nephron? How much of it can be secreted? Well, that depends on the TM. So here's the TM. Okay, the TM over here is 80. All right, so that's 80 milligrams per minute. That means that the cells, that line, okay, the nephron here can secrete this substance from the blood into the nephron up to 80 milligrams per minute. Well, how much is in the blood? Well, there's 50 milligrams per minute inside the blood. And these receptors can move 80 milligrams per minute into the nephron, which means this is under, underneath that. So this 50 milligrams per minute is less than the TM of 80 milligrams per minute. And so all of it can be moved into the nephron. And so what you're going to have is secretion of 50 milligrams into the nephron. So now what happened was not only did you filter 10 milligrams in, all right, you also secreted another 50 milligrams in for a total, all right, a total, that's 10 plus the 50, your total filtered amount, excuse me, filtered and secreted amount is 60 milligrams per minute, which is going to end up in the urine to be excreted. So that's your total amount. So let's see if that checks out over here. So let's take 10. So here's the 10 milligrams per 100 ml. That's the concentration we started with. 10 milligrams uh, per minute was filtered. So that's why this line here is showing how much got filtered. Now we calculated that about 50 milligrams uh, per minute ended up in the peritubular capillaries. So that's about right. That's right here. So this is our secreted line right here. All right, this is a secreted line. Now, we said that 50 milligrams per minute in the peritubular capillaries, all of it got secreted in. And that's true. So we have about 50 here. Okay. And so that means at right around 60, which is our total, that got excreted. Excreting meaning it ended up in the urine. So that checks out. So here's our 60 over here. This is our total. That was the amount that got excreted over here. So that was the amount that got excreted. Sorry about the pen. It seems to be doing some weird stuff. Okay, and again, you could do this over uh, with several different examples doing the same thing that I just did. And if you were to plug it in, really, once you get to about 20 milligrams, which is right here, all right, you see 20 milligrams got filtered. You would see that if you calculated what ended up in the plasma, it would be high, high to the point where it is now at the transport maximum level, which is 80. Again, that's 80 over here. Okay, you'll notice that. The higher the concentration that ends up, or excuse me, the higher the amount of substance that ends up in the peritubular capillaries, capillaries we can only reabsorb 80. So at plateaus, uh, we secrete, excuse me, we secrete only at 80 milligrams per minute, not reabsorb. We can only secrete up to 80 milligrams uh, per minute. So it plateaus at 80 because that's the TM. However, the higher and higher the uh, amount of a substance that gets filtered, from 40 to 60 to 80 milligrams per 100 ml, that means more and more substance is going to get excreted. Okay, so more will get excreted. Okay, so on this last graph, we're really just looking at something that is filtered and it is neither reabsorbed nor secreted. And this is probably the simplest of all the types where what we're going to have is just a straight linear line that reflects what was filtered because whatever gets filtered into the nephron is ultimately going to end up in the urine and be excreted. So the filtration and the excretion line are exactly the same. So you see here filtered and excreted are the same. 
And down here, the reabsorbed and secreted are at zero at all times because the substance is neither uh, reabsorbed or secreted. So whatever amount makes it in. So here, if the GFR is 100, we have 100 milligrams per 100 ml. Okay, so again, we have this linear relationship with filtration. All right, and so you can see, even if we take, you know, say 300 milligrams per 100 ml, ultimately the amount of substance that's going to get filtered or the filtered quantity is going to be 300 milligrams uh, per minute. And all 300 milligrams are going to end up in the urine simply because it cannot be reabsorbed or secreted. So the next topic I want to talk about is clearance. Clearance is used uh, clinically so that we can measure things like the GFR and the renal plasma flow. In pharmacology, you'll learn more about how it can be used to look at the clearance of certain drugs and metabolites. And it gives us a sense of how the kidney handles a particular substance. So I want to draw your attention to the boxes I've drawn up here on the upper right hand side, these little blue boxes. And I'm going to give an example that I've given before in class, which is if you were to picture each one of these as a subway car, and each subway car had 10 passengers on it. So they had a maximum of 10 passengers. Okay. Now, every single car has 10 passengers, and when it reaches the station, no passengers get on. Okay. But every single car, one passenger left. Okay. So every single car, a single passenger left. Now I have 10 cars here in total. 10 cars here in total, which means if one passenger got off of every car and there were 10 cars, that would be a total of 10 passengers that got off the, the subway train. So that's one way of looking at this. You could say, well, 10 passengers in total got off the train. Another way of looking at it is I just had 10 passengers get off the train and I know that there was a maximum of 10 passengers in every car. So I could say that one subway car was cleared of passengers. Now that was not the reality of the situation, but it's a way of looking at it. And I can actually use that way of looking at things to interpret kidney function. So let me give you a quick, another example. Let's say instead of subway cars, this is 50, each box represents 50 mLs of blood plasma. All right, so each box represents 50 mLs of blood plasma. And we'll keep the number the same inside the box. We'll say instead of 10 passengers, we'll say 10 milligrams of a substance. We'll just call it substance X, doesn't matter what it is, but we have 10 milligrams of a substance. Now, instead of going to the train station, let's just say the blood goes to the nephron. So, um, so as the blood makes its way to the nephron, and it filters, and some of it's going to be reabsorbed and secreted. Ultimately, every single 50 mLs loses one milligram. All right, so every single 50 mLs has lost one milligram of that substance. Okay, all the way down, all all 10 boxes here, which all represent the 50 mLs. All right, I can do the same thing. I could say, well, it, the total amount of substance that was ultimately excreted in the urine was 10. Uh, 10 milligrams total, just like we had 10 passengers total. But another way of looking at it is instead of saying 10 milligrams was lost, we could say actually, again, looking at that there's 10 milligrams in every 50 mLs, right? Because each box represents 50 mLs. We could say that 50 mLs of blood plasma was cleared of that substance. So in this example, I'll write it out for you. Again, 50 mLs. Uh, excuse me, was, I should say, was cleared of substance X. Was cleared of substance X. And so that's what clearance is about. It's looking at the volume, the volume that was cleared of a substance or the volume which had that substance removed from it. And so this is an important concept because what we're really trying to measure is a volume. And by being able to measure a volume, we're able to calculate these volumes over here. For example, the GFR. All right, and even plasma flow. 
which can ultimately lead to under, uh, knowing what this volume is. So we're really kind of working backwards here by looking at concentrations of substances and trying to figure out what the volumes were that they came in with. So typically in the clinical situation, we can measure concentrations of substances within the blood. So whatever that substance happens to be, all right, so I have substance X and I can figure out its concentration. Remember, the concentration is usually going to be in milligrams all right, per ml, all right, or per 100 ml or deciliter. All right, but that's our, our concentration units. And I can always measure over here the urine. So I can measure urine concentration of, a, of the substance, of substance X, as well as urine volume, because I can actually directly measure urine volume. So in other words, I could actually give a patient some substance X at a given concentration in the blood, and I can measure that concentration, okay, in their blood. So that would be the blood concentration. And then I can measure how much ended up in the urine. So I can measure the urine concentration and the urine volume. And so what I'm going to do is extrapolate and figure out what was the blood volume that that substance came from. And since it ended up in the urine, that means this blood volume was cleared of that substance. Okay, so the calculation for that is, we just say clearance is equal to the urine, all right, the urine concentration, the urine concentration of whatever substance X happens to be, all right, that's this guy down here, something, we, again, we can measure. Multiply that by the urine volume, urine, uh-oh, let's fix that, urine volume, all right, which is, again, down here, urine volume, two things we can measure, all right? Now keep in mind, by multiplying the urine concentration of that substance times the urine volume, I get the amount of a substance that has been excreted every minute, okay? Because the urine concentration is going to be in milligrams per ml, typically, times the urine volume, which is going to be in mLs per minute, which you can see down here, mLs per minute, that's a urine volume, or really it's a, a volume rate. Uh, so what happens is the milliliters would cancel out and you'd end up with milligrams per minute in the numerator. Okay, and again, those are two values that I can measure. The other value that I will know is the concentration of the substance in the blood. So for example, now I'm gonna look for the blood concentration of substance X, which those units are going to be milligrams per ml again, per ml. Sorry, my pen is acting a little strange. All right, so that's the concentration, just similar to what we saw with urine concentration is the blood concentration. So we're comparing concentrations here, all right? Now, if you guys remember your geometry, uh, excuse me, not geometry, if you guys remember your algebra, uh, in order to solve this, all right, this denominator, if I want to multiply it here, I have to invert it. So if the top, which we already multiplied together, is actually milligrams per minute. What that's saying, that's the numerator, right? The units of the numerator, milligrams per minute. That's the amount of substance that's been excreted per time. And I divide that by blood, so I'm going to invert and multiply. So that's going to be um, milliliters per milligram, okay? I just took this denominator, I had to flip it to multiply it to them, right? So it's just saying the same thing. The milligrams will cancel out, and ultimately the units of clearance, clearance is equal to milliliters per minute. Sorry again about this, but that's mils per minute. All right, that's an I there. There's mils per minute. So that's a volume per minute. That's what clearance is. And clearance really represents a blood volume. 
All right, a little difficulty with the pen here. Blood volume. So clearance represents a blood volume that's been cleared of a substance. So we're trying to figure out based on our measurement from the urine volume and the urine concentration and the blood concentration, what was the blood volume? And ultimately that's the amount uh, or the volume that has been cleared of a substance and that's in mils per minute. Now, if you're thinking back to our, the earlier couple, couple of slides, you'll remember that things like the GFR, okay, and our renal plasma flow, which I can show you over here. Okay, so you'll see renal plasma flow. The units are in mils per minute. The GFR is in mils per minute because those are volumes over time. The clearance is also a volume over time. So we're going to now take specific substances that we give patients and we're going to um, know what their concentration is in the blood and in the urine and what the urine volume is. And we'll be able to figure out a blood volume that was cleared of that substance. Now, we're going to use specific substances because depending on the behavior of that substance, the clearance is going to be a little bit different. And I'll explain that next. Okay, so let's try to figure out an example here. Now, you'll see here I have the cartoon again of our blood flow going to the glomerulus and then we have the renal plasma flow and we have uh, the filtration and let's say ultimately i want to figure out what the gfr is okay so i'm really trying to calculate this value right here i may not know what that is yet so we know what it is right here because i'm showing you the numbers right but i just want to just as an example bear with me kind of talk about the importance of picking a substance to help you calculate those values. So imagine for a second that I have 600 mils per minute, okay, moving through the, um, the vessels here is going to then filter off 100 mils per minute of that. Now of that 100 mils, most of that is going to actually be reabsorbed, right? Most of that volume gets reabsorbed. And that's, you can see that based on the fact that our urine volume is very little relative to how much gets filtered into the nephron. 100 mils doesn't end up in the urine, right? Most of that's going to get reabsorbed, 99% or even usually greater than that, okay? Now, we already took a look at in the previous slides that within that volume, we have dissolved substances. So part of the importance of this is knowing that what's dissolved in there is also can be freely filtered. So it has to be a substance that can be can move across these membranes here and make its way into the nephron. Okay. So let's just say, I'm going to put a little X here. This is our substance, whatever that X is. And it has a certain concentration, which I'm going to put mark as a bracket. And so the brackets represent a concentration of that substance has made its way into the nephron. Okay. Now there's a certain amount. Now concentration is different from the amount of a substance. The amount of a substance is the actual uh, amount of like milligrams that's present in that dissolved in that plasma volume. Now let's just say, for example, that this particular substance cannot get uh, reabsorbed. And it is also, so it's not, so this substance X, I'm gonna put over down here for us, we'll say substance X, all right, cannot be reabsorbed, cannot be reabsorbed. And we'll also say that substance X cannot be secreted. All right, so it can't be reabsorbed and it can't be secreted, which means that when this substance gets filtered in, it will ultimately make its way through the entire nephron and whatever the amount that got filtered is also going to be the amount that's going to end up in the urine. But understand this, the concentration that ends up in the urine will be different from the concentration that got filtered because they came in different volumes. So even though none of the substance got reabsorbed and nothing got secreted in, the total milligrams of that substance didn't change but the volume that it was dissolved in did because most of the volume got reabsorbed. So again, a concentration 
all right? Concentration we usually denote with brackets, all right? So concentration is typically equal to milligrams per ml, right? That's the, um, that's the amount of a substance in a given volume. This volume in the urine is a lot less. So you can have the same number of substance, okay, with a much reduced volume because it's most of it got reabsorbed okay as opposed to up here where it first came in we had a milligrams for a much higher ml all right but by the time it, most of that volume got reabsorbed we ended up with a different concentration over here again because the volume got reabsorbed even though nothing happened to the milligrams or nothing happened to the substance itself it didn't get reabsorbed or secreted so i want to make sure we're clear on that okay so a certain concentration here, which was a higher, uh, excuse me, a different concentration than what you're going to see. It doesn't necessarily have to be higher, I'm sorry, but a different concentration from what got filtered versus what got excreted. Okay? So the concentrations will differ even though the amount of substance didn't change. The milligrams may not have changed. This numerator number here, okay? may not have changed at all because that substance wasn't able to leave. It simply got filtered in. So we say this substance was neither uh, secreted nor reabsorbed, stayed the same, but its concentration changed because the volume changed as it moved through the nephron. So that's gonna give us a differing blood volume from the urine volume. And if you remember clearance, all right, so remember the clearance of the substance, I'm gonna put clearance C, X for the substance, all right, is urine concentration times um, excuse me, times the urine volume, a little V here, over the, I want to say blood, or really it's plasma concentration, but plasma concentration of that substance. So this BX here is equal to whatever this concentration is, what it got filtered. And this urine concentration we measure down here, okay, down here, what was in the urine, and then the urine volume we can measure, how much volume, which is typically going to be, if it's normal, right around about one mil per minute is average. Okay, and then we can then extrapolate or calculate what the clearance was. What was the blood volume that that came from? All right, so let's just take this example one step further now. I have a substance that can neither be secreted nor reabsorbed. So whatever amount gets filtered in here is going to end up in the urine. Okay, it's going to end up in the urine. And 99% or greater of that volume is going to get reabsorbed, which means when that volume gets reabsorbed, it's going to get moved back in. So the volume of that, whatever that plasma is, is being reabsorbed back into this peritubular capillaries here. And it's being reabsorbed without the substance coming with it, because that substance is getting left behind in the nephron. So if it essentially reabsorbs the entire filtered volume, okay, and it leaves behind the substance, that means it effectively cleared that volume of that substance because that volume is now back in the blood plasma and there's none of that substance that came with it. And it got left behind and ultimately ends up in the urine. So therefore, that volume got cleared of that substance, okay? Now, another way of looking at this uh, is you could also say, uh, or we could take another example, excuse me. Let's take something that got completely reabsorbed. All right, so let's take another substance. We'll call it substance Y. All right, and substance Y, I'm going to draw it up here. Let's say, uh, excuse me, this is not a good Y, but let's say this is substance Y over here, and it gets reabsorbed. Okay, but substance Y does not get secreted. Now let's let's take this as an example. Let's say that substance gets filtered into the nephron. All right, so it can get freely filtered into the nephron, but none of it ends up in the urine. So the urine concentration ends up being zero. Okay, so if none of it ends up in the urine. All right, so the concentration down here of substance Y, all right, is equal to zero because it all got reabsorbed, 100% got reabsorbed, let's say. So if we look at our formula here, 
All right, if the urine concentration here is equal to zero, all right, that's going to be zero. That means our clearance is zero. In other words, when the volume gets reabsorbed, so does the substance. And so the substance was never removed from that volume because the substance followed the volume back into the blood. So it was never cleared. The volume never got cleared because the volume that got reabsorbed, the substance came with it. So the clearance was zero. Okay. So we could try an example, but one of the examples I gave in the class was a substance that was neither secreted nor reabsorbed, and that was inulin. So that was an example I gave. So inulin would act like substance X. In other words, it will get filtered. It does not get reabsorbed or secreted, which means whatever amount of substance of uh, amount of that substance of inulin that gets into the nephron, it will end up in the urine and will reabsorb most of the volume, which means that since inulin is neither secreted nor reabsorbed, when it gets filtered, it gets excreted and we remove or re re reabsorb most of the volume. So the volume gets cleared of that inulin. And in fact, pretty much close to the volume that gets cleared of inulin is the GFR. So the clearance, the clearance of inulin is equal to the GFR. Okay, so again, if inulin gets filtered here, it's going to end up in the urine. And we're going to reabsorb, again, we're just going to reabsorb all that volume without the substance. The substance is going to get lost into the urine, which means all that reabsorbed volume comes without the substance inulin, so it's being cleared. And we're not secreting any more inulin in, okay? We're not reabsorbing any of the inulin out of the nephron. So therefore, the total volume that has just been cleared was the GFR volume, was the volume that it came in with. And we can calculate that. So that could, in this case, you know, we could say it could come out to about 100 mLs, or if it's an average kidney or kidneys, then it's going to be somewhere between 100 and 120 mLs. And that's because of the property of inulin. It doesn't get secreted or reabsorbed. Whatever gets filtered ends up in the urine, and the volume gets completely reabsorbed. So it's been cleared. So the volume that's been cleared of inulin is the GFR volume. Okay, let's try another example. So the example I gave before was a substance that was neither secreted nor reabsorbed, which was inulin. So when inulin gets filtered into the nephron, it, all of it ends up in the urine. And the volume mostly gets reabsorbed. So therefore, the volume that was cleared of inulin was the GFR volume. Now we use another substance, and this substance is referred to as PAH, or para-aminohypuric acid. So let me write that over here. All right, so the substance we're talking about now is PAH. All right, now PAH, one of its important properties is that it is secreted. And PAH is not reabsorbed. All right, so it is secreted. That's one of its key components here is that it gets secreted in. Now, when we give it, we give it a concentration where it will be less than the TM for PAH. By the way, the TM for PAH is equal to 80 milligrams per minute. Now, just to remind you, the TM represents the maximum transport of moving a certain amount of milligrams per minute that the receptor is capable of doing for a given substance. So PAH is capable of being removed from the peritubular capillaries and moved into the nephron at a rate of 80 milligrams per minute. So if the PAH that ends up in the peritubular capillaries is going to be secreted in, the TM for that is 80 milligrams per Per minute okay that means based on the examples I gave from the earlier slides is that if the PAH um, 
amount of the PH substance, excuse me, is above 80 milligrams per minute moving through the peritubular capillaries, like say 85 or 90 or 95 and so on, then that's not going to get secreted into the nephron. It'll stay in the peritubular capillaries. Okay, so now the importance of this is that, again, some PAH is going to get filtered in. Okay, so a certain amount of the PAH is going to get filtered in. It does not get reabsorbed. That means whatever PAH got filtered in will ultimately end up in the urine. So we're going to have a certain concentration that's going to end up in the urine. All right, now that's based solely on what got filtered in. Since we can't remove it from the nephron, it will end up in the urine. However, we have the added complexity of the fact that pH, the portion of the pH that did not get filtered but ended up in the peritubular capillaries, that can still be transported and moved into the nephron. So it's going to add to what was filtered as well. So whatever the amount of pH that got filtered initially, all right, we're going to add to that by secreting some more in. Now, usually when we give the pH, we try to keep it at a concentration that's low enough to be below the TM. Why is that? Well, let's just say that if we treated pH like inulin, if it were neither secreted nor reabsorbed, that means whatever amount got filtered in and ended up in the, the urine, and we reabsorb all the volume, remember we take all the volume, we reabsorb that volume, that volume, right? would get reabsorbed without the substance or without PAH. So therefore, that would be the GFR, right? That's how we get in, that's what inulin is useful for. However, yes, we are gonna reabsorb that volume. So the PAH that gets filtered, all right, will get removed from the volume that it got filtered in, which would be the GFR. All right, it does get filtered and removed from that volume, so that would be the GFR. However, the pH isn't used to calculate GFR because the pH in the peritubular capillaries ends up inside the nephron, and usually all of it ends up inside the nephron. In other words, the total amount of pH that ends up in the peritubular capillaries is below the TM, so all of it gets removed from the peritubular capillaries and ends up entirely in the nephron and there's no longer there's no longer any pH in the peritubular capillaries so not only was the pH that got the volume of uh, with which the pH came in with or filtered with the pH will be removed from that volume which was the GFR but the pH that was in the peritubular capillaries it's completely removed from that volume as well so therefore pH was also cleared from the peritubular capillary volume, from the, excuse me, the capillary volume, because that substance was completely taken out of the blood plasma, moved into the nephron, and ended up in the urine, along with the amount that got filtered. So we cleared the GFR volume of it, and we also cleared the peritubular volume of it completely. And so I can actually add these two together, and the volume of GFR plus the capillary volume, all right, is actually equal to my renal flow. Excuse me, renal plasma flow. Right, so take these numbers for example. If the GFR was 100, it came in with 100 mLs, the pH was removed from that 100 mLs, okay? So that 100 mLs essentially gets reabsorbed. And if the volume of the peritubular capillaries is 500, the pH was completely removed from that 500 mLs and secreted into the nephron. So we reabsorbed the volume from the nephron and redistributed it back to the blood. And we removed the pH from the capillaries and put it back and put it into the nephron. So what ends up happening is we've just cleared not only the GFR, which in this example is say 100 mLs per minute, plus the capillary volume, which is 500 which is going to give us 600 mLs per minute. That's the volume that was cleared. That means we've completely removed the substance, not only from the GFR, but also from the peritubular capillaries. So those two volumes would come out to about 600 mLs per minute. 600 mLs per minute is actually over here. That's our renal plasma flow. 
Now, the reason this works so well is because, first off, pH is freely filtered and pH is secreted. And it's usually almost, almost 100% secreted into the nephron. In this example, I'm assuming that it's 100% secreted in, which means that it's at a low enough concentration in the blood to be underneath the TM so we can completely remove it. Okay? So that's an important key concept here, is that the PAH in the peritubular capillary, that concentration of PAH, that amount of substance, excuse me, that amount of substance of PAH has to be below the TM. And then if it's below the TM, then those transporters will remove PAH entirely from the peritubular uh, uh, plasma, which means the peritubular plasma has been cleared of that substance. Ultimately, all of that will end up in the urine. Now, again, if I give you the numbers, you could actually calculate that and put that directly into the formula and find that out for yourselves. It would come out to about 600 mLs. Okay. So you guys can try that with uh, from the examples from class. Okay, so I gave you guys two examples using very specific substances, PAH and inulin, and both those substances help us calculate the GFR and the renal plasma flow, which can be very important calculations uh, for, for clinicians. Now, I can also use... Um, other substances and calculate their clearances and that can give me information about how the kidney handles that substance in other words is that substance secreted is that substance reabsorbed or is that substance like inulin and it's neither secreted nor reabsorbed so let me see if I can show you what I mean so for example if I have the clearance of some substance, which I'll mark as X, and I make a ratio with the clearance of inulin. Why am I looking at the clearance of inulin? Because the clearance of inulin is going to equal the person's GFR based on the fact that it's neither secreted nor reabsorbed. So it's cleared from the filtration volume, which is the GFR. Okay, so if I have the clearance of inulin, I know what the GFR is, then I can compare the substance, whatever substance X is, to its clearance to the GFR. The GFR is my baseline. That's the volume from which, uh, excuse me, the volume that was filtered from which the substance was removed, right? So that was the inulins, that's the GFR. All right. Now I'm going to compare other substances to that GFR. So the first thing you're going to do when calculating clearances is first figure out what that GFR is and then see how the clearance compares to that. Okay, so let's just take an example. If I have some substance X, and let's say the GFR is 100 mLs per minute. That was the person's GFR based on using inulin, let's say. Now understand, in, in clinical practice, we usually use creatinine instead of inulin, which is not as accurate, but very, very close. And so since creatinine, for the most part, is neither secreted nor reabsorbed, it'll usually be a good calculation or a good marker of the GFR. Okay, so now inulin or creatinine can give us our GFR, which is, let's say, 100 mils per minute. Now, let's say that the clearance of this other substance <coughs> excuse me, is 50 mLs per minute. All right, now 50 mLs is less than... 100 mLs. Now, 100 mLs is the GFR. It's the volume that gets filtered. Okay. This is a volume, 50 mLs, excuse me, is less than the GFR. Another way of looking at this is whatever this substance is, it was not completely cleared from the GFR. All right. It was not completely cleared of 100 mLs. So essentially, whatever got filtered in, some of it must have been reabsorbed because we did not clear the entire 100 mLs. Instead, we only cleared 50 of it. That means half the volume was actually cleared and half the volume wasn't. So in order for only half the volume to be cleared, that means in this case, this substance must have been reabsorbed. 
must have been reabsorbed because we couldn't even clear the entire GFR. We only cleared half of it, which means some of it must have followed the volume that was being reabsorbed from the nephron. Let's try another example. What if instead, well, again, we're going to use the same GFR. Let's say it's 100 mLs and we got this using creatinine or inulin. 100 mLs per minute. All right. And instead it was 150 mLs per minute. All right. So in this case, this would represent secretion. Why? Well, we filtered this volume, 100 mLs, okay? But here, 150 is greater than 100, which means we've cleared a larger volume than the volume that was filtered, which means the volume that we cleared in addition to the filtered volume must have come from somewhere else. And that volume that we cleared came from the peritubular plasma, which means we removed some substance from the peritubular plasma enough to clear about 50 mLs of it in addition to the 100 mLs we cleared from filtration. So this is greater than the GFR, and that means secretion. So in other words, right, if the clearance of substance X is greater than the GFR, okay, then that means it was secreted in. If the clearance of substance X was less than the GFR, then it was reabsorbed. Another classic example for this one, so this is example one right here, is glucose, right? Glucose is about 100% reabsorbed. And so generally you'd have zero mils per minute that's being um, cleared under normal healthy conditions. And so it would be definitely be a lot less than the filtered volume. On the other hand, we could have over here, um, you know, the example we just had, the PAH right it's secreted in the pH its clearance is typically about 600 mils per minute on average right and the 100 mils that it got filtered in with and so this is definitely greater and this substance is actually secreted in and not reabsorbed so we use this ratio of comparing the clearance of certain substances to the GFR to give us an idea of whether or not that substance was secreted or reabsorbed. And so we follow that general rule. Okay, so I wanna end this review by quickly giving you an example that we can uh, calculate for clearance. So let's take, all right, let's take our clearance formula, which again, clearance is equal to the urine concentration times the urine volume over the plasma concentration all right so this is to calculate clearance this is what we talked about in the previous slides i'm just using a little bit of shorthand here now let's say um we have sodium let's take sodium as an example now if you guys recall from my lectures sodium the majority of sodium is uh reabsorbed so let's see if this actually works out let's use some numbers here so sodium concentration is usually around about 140 uh, milli equivalents per liter. All right. In this example, the urine, so this is going to be blood, by the way. So blood or plasma concentration of sodium. The urine concentration of sodium, let's say, is 700 milli equivalents per liter and we'll say the urine volume or flow is equal to one ml per minute which would be our average okay so let's plug this in if i have the clearance of sodium is equal to the urine concentration which we said was 700 right that's 700 that's over here 700 so that's 700 milli equivalents per liter milli equivalents per liter times one ml 
per minute. That's my urine volume or urine rate. All over the blood concentration, which was 140 milli equivalents per liter. Okay. So now if I want to calculate this out, I would have to do some conversions of the liters into mLs. Okay, so I want to keep the units the same. So I'm going to show you over here. Okay, let me change some of the units here. So I want to know the clearance of sodium. All right, it's going to be equal to uh, 700 milli equivalents per 1,000 mL, because I want it to be in mL. So one liter equals 1,000 mL times one ml per minute. So this way, all I did was just convert one, the liter into milliliters so that I could keep the units the same. All right. And 140 milli equivalents per liter, but that would be a thousand mLs here as well. So that way, again, I'm keeping the units all the same. And if you do the calculation here, all right, I'll move it over here so we can see. So I have the clearance of sodium. This would be 0 0.7 milli equivalents per minute, per minute over 0 0.14 milli equivalents per ml. So all I did was solve the, the top part here. The mLs cancel out, divided that by 1,000, which is 0 0.7, okay? And then down here, I just divided the 140 by the 1,000, get 0 0.14. And then finally, the clearance of sodium is equal to 5 mLs per minute. So the question is, what's the significance of this? Right, the clearance of sodium. So what I did is I like to take the real world example of an actual concentration of say an electrolyte like sodium and see what the renal clearance is of sodium. Now I could have taken any particular substance, okay? I could have picked some metabolite or something else. We could have even done glucose or something of that nature, but I want to try this electrolyte. We know its blood concentration is about 140 milli equivalents and I gave you the urine concentration and the urine volume. I kept the urine volume on average, which is about one mil per minute. And in fact, 700 milli equivalents per liter is pretty close to normal as well. So I'm giving you very uh, real numbers here. And what I want you to see is that there is some clearance of sodium, right? About five mils per minute. So five mils every minute is, uh, is cleared of sodium. Now, that number, we have to compare it to a GFR to make any kind of sense of it, right? And so you should hopefully know that five mils per minute is very much below an actual GFR, normal GFR. So our GFRs, I'll write it up here, are typically on average anywhere from about 100, excuse me, to about 125. So if I take a look at the ratio, like I showed you from the last example, five mils per minute, all right, five mils per minute is less than, obviously, 100 mils right? So it's less than our GFR. In other words, let's say our GFR was 100 mils. Okay, it's less than the GFR. So since it's less than, what does that tell you about the nature of what happens to sodium primarily? Now, it's very, very low. So that should tell you that sodium is primarily reabsorbed. It's reabsorbed. It's primarily reabsorbed because all the fluid that gets reabsorbed in the kidney, sodium follows along with it, which is something we already know. But this number tells me since it's very, very close, it's very far away from the GFR and pretty close to zero, means that the majority of sodium gets reabsorbed. If we were to do the same calculation with glucose, you would see that glucose's clearance is zero, okay, because it gets completely reabsorbed. Most of the sodium gets reabsorbed, but some of it will get excreted. 
and so since it's way below the GFR, the majority of it gets reabsorbed.